Hello. Welcome back to Intelligent Design. I'm your host, Dan Felder, and this is Braid. Oh my god, this game. This game is a legend among independent developers, and really anybody interested in game design in general has probably heard of it and likely played it and enjoyed it. I want to break down why it works so well. As you may already know, this game is all about two things. Using its main mechanic as a central and powerful, almost literary metaphor, and subverting our classic experience with 2D platformers, and using those two things together to create an incredible experience. Right from the start, they subvert our initial approach of what an opening screen is. When you start the game, you're taken to this. It looks like a menu screen, but then it says, as we saw, use the arrow keys to move. We're able to move around. The focus is on the background. The focus is on the background, not the foreground. Usually in these 2D platformers, the background is undetailed or irrelevant. Look at this beautiful background we've got, and look at us in this darkness. A very powerful and, and aesthetically pleasing opening. It's very easy to do something different just to be different, but it also needs to still be good. Otherwise, it's just not just different, it's bad. Doing something different needs to be good, still. Otherwise, you don't gain any benefits from being different, you're just doing something inferior. So this um, flips the focus on the foreground and the background, and it creates a sense of mystery and intrigue in us that way, and it delivers it back pretty quickly, but also it creates a sense of something um, unusual and beautiful, because we still have this beautiful, majestic music, very unusual from the positive opening songs and action-packed energy of a lot of platformers. And it creates a beautiful backdrop. And we're Hugh Grant. I've heard this described as basically a miniaturized um, video game version of Hugh Grant, and it really looks like that. It's a little silly, um, but it does fit with the world. Which world is that? World 2. World 2. That's a little weird. Usually, World 1 comes first, right? Well, this is a referencing Mario, as we'll see in this game, and it becomes more and more obvious later on. At first, it's not entirely obvious, then it gets really obvious later on. This game is directly and obviously referencing Mario. It's using Mario as the backdrop for our understanding of platformers, so that people will understand when it starts subverting something and what the, and wonder, why is it doing that? And what do these connections mean? You can't really subvert someone's expectations if they don't have any to begin with. Now, one of the first subversions is World 2. Starting with World 2, well, where is World 1? It's not here, not here, not down there, not up here. Well, maybe World 2 is one of these places, but we can't access it yet. Either way, why are we starting with World 1? Why aren't we starting with World 1? Why are we starting with World 2? Well, Mario, again, uses the terminology of worlds, and we're familiar with World 1, World 2, World 3, World 4. Um, it's a rather unusual terminology. Usually we would associate level, perhaps, or stage, or just even, you know, just area, zone, that sort of thing. Or just give it a title. You know, say, like, you know, this is this this is Skyline. This is, you know, Jungle Forest. Why call it World 1, World 2? Well, because Mario is doing that. And it's trying to connect it. Now, this game is all about subverting expectations, so I want to briefly talk about how to do it well and how, it, and how to not do it well. So, our brains are basically guessing machines. We try to predict how the world is going to react. If we see something hurling towards us on the highway, it's very beneficial to our survival to know that it will hit us if we don't jump out of the way. So, our brains try to keep us alive by predicting how the world will react to everything. We want to know if we say something, will it hurt somebody's feelings or will it make them laugh? If we don't know that, if we accidentally hurt people's feelings and we want to make them laugh or make people laugh that we're trying to make feel bad, then we, ha we don't have as very good operation in the world. We're trying to act better in the world. So, our brains pay attention to anything that breaks what we expected. If we expected the ball to drop, and instead it flew up, our eyebrows go up, our jaws drop, literally, and our eyes widen. We try to pay a lot of attention. Our brain is making us pay physically as much attention as possible to this expectation-defying thing. That's because our brain wants to know why this happened, and we start looking for an answer. That creates curiosity. The problem is, if the artist just decided to, hey, I'm going to do it differently because, I mean, I mean it's awesome, and I'm, I'm autistic, and it's super cool, because, I mean, I mean, screw the establishment, man. The problem is, if there's no reason behind it, if it doesn't actually, if it's not understandable, if it's not clear why they do it that way, if you're not able to reach a resolution, you're not able to find an answer for why your expectations were violated, 
You're not able to find an answer for why your expectations were violated. It doesn't make sense. The brain just creates more and more frustration because you, the brain needs to make you stop trying to figure this out eventually if it's an impossible task. The, so our brain builds up frustration whenever we're faced with tasks that um, the more we fail, the more frustration we build up because our brain is trying to keep steadily ratcheting up our negative feelings until it exceeds our desire to figure something out or to accomplish something. That's how we don't stop, start, keep trying to do the same thing forever. So if your audience can't figure out why you're subverting their expectations, why you're starting with World 2 instead of World 1, why you're doing that, then they will get more and more frustrated and eventually start resenting your work. Not what you want. Braid is smarter than that. Braid is going to have this be here for a reason. And now why World 2? Why not World 3, World 4, World 5? Well, you could have done that. But World 2, I think, is the best choice. Because World 2 is this, as close as possible to the beginning while still breaking your expectation. It is the smallest possible disruption of our expectation while still being a disruption. Time and forgiveness. We look like we're in heaven, don't we? Are we dead, maybe? Possibly, possibly not. Hard to tell. Um, and the big time and forgiveness looks like an elegant chapter heading. It creates a sense of poetry and resonance, something larger than ourselves. Um, our brains tap into that emotion a little bit, and it's very subtle, but it works. Now here's what's not subtle. Six books full of wall of text. This is probably the most argued about thing in game designers about whether this was a good idea or not. Most of the time, the argument seems to go like, I didn't read the books, the game was awesome, the book shouldn't be there. Other argument seems to be the books are incredibly important to understanding the world. Um, I read them all, and they were so helpful, and there's so much information in them. Um... And the game's usually, as you'll see, very minimalistic. It does almost nothing. These giant walls of text is just ridiculous. And I come right down the middle. I think that these books are incredibly important to understanding the depth and meaning in the game, and it makes the experience so much richer. It makes the experience so much richer. But they need to cut it down. Let's see how. Tim is off on search to rescue the princess. She has been snatched by a horrible and evil monster. This happened because Tim made a mistake. Very click. Very cl quick, clean, clear writing here. Clearly referencing Mario again, but also it adds the, this happened because Tim made a mistake. This creates a sense of, of, sub of ownership over the situation. That's unusual. Usually Mario just goes rescues from the evil monster, but clearly he's, he has a sense of added personal investment here. That's good. This is a pretty clean piece of text. I would cut the horrible and evil, just be snatched by a horrible monster, snatched by an evil monster, but that's not that big a deal. Not just one. He made many mistakes during the time they spent together all those years ago. Memories of their relationship have become muddled, replaced wholesale, but one remains clear. The princess yada yada yada. Tur her braid lashing at him with contempt. Hey, we title dropped. That's braid. Maybe that's why this is called braid, because that's a really random thing. Like, talking about a braid, the person's braid as she turns away. Kind of dumb. He knows she tried to be forgiving, but who can just shrug away a guilty lie, a stab in the back? Uh, such a mistake will change your relationship irreversibly, even if we have... Okay, this is just so much text. I can't even read it out loud without becoming bored. And look how over the top the language is. The princess's eyes narrow... grew narrower. Not even... The princess's eyes narrowed. Like something simple like that. Grew narrower. She became more distant. Why am I making fun of this text? Because this is where people's eyes start rolling. I have seen dozens of people play this game, literally dozens, because um, when I was running the media lab at Oregon State University, we had a small number of games that all the students played and had to write like ref reflections about. And this was one of them. People see that and they're like, okay. And okay, there's six books. It's a lot of books, but um, you know, this is gonna be okay. This is the short. They see this and they're like, okay, that's not great. And the writing is not amazing either. So at that point, they kind of stop reading when they see this one again, and it really their eyes roll, and they just run through the rest of them, and they can I just skip these, and then yes, they can. Which sucks, because buried in these last three books is something so important to understanding the game and realizing how powerful it is. And here it is in book four, which sucks, because in book three is when people really get sick of it. You could cut both these books, really. Our world, with its rules of causality, has trained us to be miserly with forgiveness. That's great writing. Miserly with forgiveness. By forgiving too readily, we become badly hurt. But if we learn from a mistake and become better for it, shouldn't we be rewarded for the learning rather than punished? Okay, that's a clear idea. What if our world worked differently? Suppose we could tell her things and she could say yes, and then we're, and then we're happy and it's good, and then we're still happy and it's still good. 
and our mistakes are hidden from each other, tucked away between the folds of time, safe. All right, here's how I would cut this down. Kim is off on a search to rescue the princess. She has been snatched by a horrible monster. This happened because Tim made a mistake. Our world, with its rules of causality, has trained us to be miserly with forgiveness. By forgiving too readily, we can become badly hurt. What if we learn from a mistake? Shouldn't we be rewarded for the learning rather than punished? What if our world worked differently? Three easy pieces. Alright, the fact that it says three easy pieces is great, because it calls our attention to the fact that there are going to be puzzle pieces, as you'll see later. We don't need to know they're puzzle pieces yet, we'll see them later. And the fact that they're the fact that they're easy is what implies that we're supposed to be doing something, some sort of challenge in order to get them. Otherwise, you don't describe something that you're not supposed to do with as easy, because the fact is that um, it's only easy if it's a task we're trying to succeed at. But let's talk about this opening screen. This is Mario. This is World 1-1 from Mario. They start you really far to the left of the screen on a featureless flat area, and if you try to go backwards, you can't. In Mario World 1-1, in the very first Mario, it's because the screen can't handle that. But here it's because there's a wall. And you still can't go back to the back from where you came, because there's a wall here. This is referencing Mario 1-1 very clearly. Now, you might not recognize that consciously, but it doesn't matter because your brain will subconsciously pick up on it. And even if it doesn't, who cares? It's still a fine way to open the game, but this is referencing Mario 1-1. So basically, people might not pick up on that, so people often say, like, oh, it's minor, who's going to notice that? But if you do notice it, great. If your brain subconsciously picks it up, great. And if they don't, who cares? It's still a fine opening. You risk nothing by trying to layer in these subtle metaphors and subtle connections. Space bar. All right. That does not tell me to press spacebar, but just calls my attention to spacebar. This is very important, because um, when you tell a player, do something, a lot of times there's a reluctance to it. They don't want to follow instructions. This is why players often hate tutorials. Um, so what's clever here is that while there are entire games built around players trying to ignore instructions, like the Stanley Parable, and they're great, um, this one just suggests it. Like, spacebar? There's almost a question mark there. And so players say, huh, what happens if I press the space bar? Oh, I jump. Okay, that's great. And we reinforce that by jumping, not requiring the player to jump not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. Now we have up. Simple. This whole opening is very well paced because oftentimes players see the space bar while they're running towards it still, and they'll jump, and then they'll keep jumping, and they'll jump right over it. So it'll be basically something more like this. Um, they'll be running towards it, see the space bar, and they try jumping, and they just keep going. Maybe a slight bounce off and keep going. It feels like the tutorial is barely even slowing them down. It's just a positive speed momentum. And then because this um, up arrow is not just a ladder all the way over here, but a ladder all, but an area all the way over here, they can press up during any part of the section. They can see the arrow here and start pressing, and then press up at any point during the sequence, and they will start climbing up. And there's a sense of forward momentum, which is why it's not just straight up. Also, let's take a look at the reason that they chose this fence here, and this climbing ivy. Climbing ivy. Very clever. Some types of design look like they're intended for other types of things. If you look at a door that has a handle on it, handles afford pulling. So people often want to pull the door when they see it. I remember there's a, there was this door at college, um, and all the cafeterias, they just had double-sided handles on each one, each side. So going into the thing, it was fine. You never pull, pushed or pulled the wrong way. You always grabbed the handle, pulled it open, you walked inside. But I remember sitting in the cafeterias and watching people repeatedly walk to the door, people who've been there for years, and pull first and then push again. Because we see a handle, we think pulling. That's what handles are used for. That's what they're good for. Um, we see a flat bar, even a flat piece of metal, we think pushing. How does that relate here? Well, good design should afford the type of thing that you want to do. So this could have just been a like a slightly different blacky rock wall or something like that, and like a lot of games do. But instead, they created a sense of um, a, a fence, a fence with handholds, and also that climbing ivy is climbing up. You know, maybe it doesn't make a big difference, but it makes a little difference. And if you add a little thing like this that makes your game 0.01% better, 0.01% better, thousands and thousands of times on every single one of your choices, eventually your game becomes 100% better. So, that is awesome. 
Um, and the fact is, they're going to use ladders a lot lately, but they really wanted to create that sense of momentum and being forgiving to press up while you're on the ladder itself. If the ladder was all the way over here, as we've seen before, as we'll see later, you could only go right to the end, you'd have to break and stop, and then go up. But by having this whole open section, you can forgivingly fly right up and have a sense of momentum through the tutorial. Why is this one here? We don't really need to be retaught how to climb. It's pretty obvious. Um, in fact, it's the, the designer carries so little that he actually let us use, fall down if we're trying to explore the other areas near a ladder before we got this information. We try to look for World 2 in the various rooms. So why do we need this one? Well, it's not actually here to teach you that you need momentum. It's really there to um, teach you that these buttons really should be trusted. If you see one of these buttons, you should press it, because it's about to become incredibly important that you know this. This is just reinforcing it, like having three jumps instead of one, even though one should be enough. And it's a slightly different um, challenge. Get you to go all the way up and to the top. It's an excuse to give you two buttons instead of one. And it makes it feel like they're teaching you something new, even though it's not at all relevant. Here's that ladder I was talking about. <laughs> Music stops. We have this little uh, face that he makes um, right when he gets hit that uh, makes it look like a Three Stooge getting hit over the head or something. It's really a goofy sort of slapstick thing. We have a sort of a boink, bonk, oof sound to it that uh, seems goofy and the music stops and it looks a little absurd um, and also it's jarring and had the high contrast between cutting the music having this boof sound and seeing us stuck on the screen when everything has been so beautiful and so pleasant that makes people laugh and that's crucial because the first time you fail in a game that is often the point where a lot of people stop playing hearthstone recently redid its tutorial slightly to have it be that if players failed one of the early missions they would often try one more time. If they failed again, they would often quit. So what happens is that if you fail the first time, the mission forces you to succeed the second time. It's not great, but it's way better than risking people actually just quitting forever. Once people have established a bit more of an emotional bond with your game, then you can have them fail more and be a bit more harsh with your failure. But you want people to have a positive initial experience. That's also why we have this beautiful opening atmosphere. Um, when you're actually in this level, this level feels beautiful, pleasant. The music is gorgeous and majestic, and it's a pleasant place to be. There's the sun out, the blue skies, the greens. It's so beautiful and pleasant that we already want to spend time in this world. We already want to stay in this world. We want to spend time here. We are more emotionally connected to the world, and we don't really want to leave, which is very important because we're about to start failing a lot if you're a new player. Now, you can see that that's flashing shift. Um, that is an important button press. So let's see what happens when I press it. Okay. I can undo time. That's pretty interesting. That's one of the core mechanics of the game. And it's also the most forgiving element of it. And as you can see, when we talked about the mechanics and the, as metaphor, the idea is what happens if you um, could undo your mistakes? The mechanic is all about undoing your mistakes. That's very clever. Mechanic as metaphor. And it helps reinforce things. The game is still fun even without a metaphor. M the metaphor is still meaningful, even, and the discussion of the philosophy is still interesting even without the mechanic. But together, they work together to reinforce each other. Neither is necessary, but they complement one another. Very well done. Also, let's take a look at this red stuff here. Now. Jonathan Blow's design here is so good at reinforcing what he wants you to do. He basically is very minimalistic with his design. And most people think, oh, he doesn't put many things. He doesn't give you much information. That just means we don't need to give players much information. No, he gives tons of information. It's just that he reinforces a simple idea thousands and thousands of times. You have the extra arrows like, and the extra sections that you saw over there. We have this down here. Spikes should be enough to tell you that we shouldn't fall on them, right? How about fire? Fire spikes. Mm, not enough. How about also a black-red color palette when everything around us that we like to walk on is blue and green, and red is the complement of green? <laughs> and we also, let's call attention to it with clear animation showing that there's also steam and smoke rising off of these things. This is so much repetitive, reinforcing good design for imagery to teach us what we're doing. Jonathan Blow gives us a huge amount of information in this game. It just doesn't come across as consciously teaching because he does it better. Does it better. Speaking of which, look at this prompt. 
Shift appears right over our dead body. When we fall, our emphasis, of course, is we're tracking our character on the screen. So we fall, and that's where our eyes are. Now, a lot of weaker uh, user interface designers say you should have the buttons always on the same part of the screen. That way the player knows where to go for information. That's respectable. But it's way more important to have it be where your eye already is. And so this little tiny shift on the screen, a lot of user designers would scream about that. Because saying, what, it's so tiny, what if they miss it? Well, you don't, well he knows that he's not, you're not gonna miss it because it's right over you. You're like, oh, what happened to me? And the shift button is right where your eyes naturally are. If you put the shift in, you could put the shift to be the top half of the entire screen and we would be less likely to see it if our eyes aren't already looking there than we are to see this shift button, this tiny shift button right above us. And it's also blinking to imply both that it catches attention and we should imply pressing it. And one of the side effects is that we often people just press the button, but they don't hold the button, but they see there's making a difference, so eventually they hold it, and that's okay. Which is also why, by the way, they don't just teach us the jump button early, because the jump button is all about tapping. We tap the jump button to jump. We don't need to hold it down, but the climb to climb up, we need to hold a button down. So that shows us that we can that holding a button down is sometimes the answer. Reinforces that very cleverly. Look at that. It's expanding and it flies to the top. They could easily just had like um, hit it and then have it immediately appear at the top. Maybe it flashes up there, but instead it tracks our eye. The puzzle piece, the moment we hit it, expands and flies up to the top of the screen. Jonathan Blow is following our eye movements. That's why this game feels so smooth. That's why it feels so clean. That Those little choices and design choices make the whole thing more smooth. And there's a Goomba. Little fat guy with a head, brown, he's got giant shoes. Yeah, that's a Goomba. All right, and we got a sign saying to jump on it. We already know we're supposed to jump on Goombas, but we can jump on it with that, that sign's going to also tell us. All right. That's another element of Mario that's really good, because it's talking about a game we already know how to play, and it's giving us sig symbols and signatures that we already know how to play. Signatories. Like the... Wait, signatories? Guys who sign a contract? I don't know what I'm saying. But signifiers. There's we go. Signifiers. I know words. Um, because they're giving us signifiers of people, of things of the game that we already understand, it's building on our existing knowledge of how to play these games, which is great. Let Mario do the work for us. That's not like Mario. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Try that again. It sounds like an old man being punched in the stomach. That is not a happy sound. Now, the classic type of thing you want to do in level design is have, um, if your game is about jumping on enemies, you want to make the enemy jumping sound good. You want a big physical and positive sound. Often a happy little boing sound or some other satisfying sound. Uh, or a whoop, 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 which is often what the early Mario games did. Um, it just sounds a little bit cheerful. This is not cheerful. Old man being punched in the stomach is not cheerful. But this tells us two things. One, it subverts your expectation. And also, it's a little funny, <laughs> if you're not, because it's so so contradictory to what we're expecting. It's a bit funny, but also um, it subverts your expectation. Good for the purpose of the game, but it does so meaningfully because the game is not about jumping on enemies. The game is about getting puzzle pieces. However, sometimes you need to do that in order to get it. Can't jump to get it. Get some more height. Can't get it. Enemy. All right. So they jump to. Get they teach us how to jump on enemies, and then they make it crucial to use it. Clever. Also, again, notice we're getting these puzzle pieces in reverse order. The first one, if, we, if you read from left to right, um, um, has not been gotten yet. The third one got was gotten first. The second one was gotten second. Um, so it went 3, 2, 1, not 1, 2, 3. Here's a piece. All right. Um, huh. Okay. And I seem to get it. We try two. So again, that teaches us a bit more about how to jump on enemies, how to fall. Likely people are going to accidentally walk into a lot of enemies during the sequence. You see that a lot. Um, a lot of gamers who are less experienced with platformers often mess up this section a lot. And they rewind a lot to get the hang of it. But the thing is, why are these cannons here? You see that basically, as long as there are less than the total number of enemies you need to solve the puzzle in this section, they don't fire unless there are fewer than the total number of enemies that you need to solve the section. If there's less than two here, it fires another enemy. And 
That's going to fire too. You don't need this. People can rewind time. If you mess things up, you kill the wrong enemy and miss your jump, you can just rewind that time. But people don't really aren't really used to that yet. So often people in this early level would uh, kill a bunch of enemies. Then if the enemies are not reappearing, they would try to get it. They would try to get it. They missed their jump. Then they'd maybe go over, do the, try to do this one, maybe mess that up, maybe succeed. And then they'd come back to here. And now it's been like two minutes. And they, have to, and they have to wait for rewinding for like two minutes. That would be very bad. So instead, we give you these cannons that replenish these enemies to make sure you always have time to realize you made the mistake and then to try again. Very forgiving. Also, the fact that they have those fuses tells you how long it's going to wait until it's actually time to shoot one of these guys out. Which is not important now, but it will be important for puzzles later. So it's nice that they already just are consistent about that. All right, spacebar. Jump, jump, jump. Why is this here? We don't need this. We don't need this platform. We can just jump right over the platform. This is like the smallest jump I've ever seen. Why do we need this platform here? Well, these platforms are going to become incredibly crucial to solving a puzzle in the very next room. What they do here is they give us a huge number of them to show us how they work. Like, look, you can land on these. Look, you can land on these. Look, you can land on these. Um, and you jump over them, add this extra one here. Probably was not there in the original um, game design. I highly doubt it. It looks completely ridiculous there. But it looks like he probably needed just a bit more reinforcing, because this puzzle's hard to solve. And we walk through the door. The Cloud Bridge. All right. Well, thanks very much for listening to Intelligent Design. I hope you enjoyed it. You can try another stuff at danfelder.net. I've got where I post these videos and my two podcasts and various thoughts and articles and ideas I have on game design. And I hope you enjoy it. You can also follow me at danfelder, uh, sorry, at designerdanf. And yeah, it's really cool. I hope to see you soon and see you next time where we will tackle the Cloud Bridge in Braid.